The Twilight Zone is an American media franchise based on the anthology television series created by Rod Serling. The episodes are in various genres, including fantasy, science fiction, suspense, horror, and psychological thriller, often concluding with a macabre or unexpected twist, and usually with a moral. A popular and critical success, it introduced many Americans to common science fiction and fantasy tropes. The original series, shot entirely in black and white, ran on CBS for five seasons from 1959 to 1964. The Twilight Zone followed in the tradition of earlier television shows such as Tales of Tomorrow (1951–53) and science fiction theater (1955–57), radio programs such as The Weird Circle (1943–45), Dimension X (1950–51), and X-1 (1955–58), and the radio Radio work of one of Serling's inspirations, Norman Corwin. The success of the series led to a feature film, 1983, a TV film, 1994, a radio series, 2002 to 12, literature including a comic book, novels, and a magazine, and a theme park attraction, and various other spin-offs that spanned five decades, including two revival television series. The first revival (1985–89) ran on CBS and in syndication in the 1980s, while the second revival ran on UPN (2002–2003). TV Guide ranked the original TV series number 5 in their 2013 list of the 60 greatest shows of all time and number 4 in their list of the 60 greatest dramas. In December 2017, CBS All Access officially ordered the third Twilight Zone revival to series, helmed by Jordan Peele. The series premiered on April 1, 2019. Topic: Television history. Topic: Background. As a boy, Rod Serling was a fan of pulp fiction stories. As an adult, he sought topics with themes such as racism, government, war, society, and human nature in general. Serling decided to combine these two interests as a way to broach these subjects on television at a time when such issues were not commonly addressed. Throughout the 1950s, Serling established himself as one of the most popular names in television. He was as famous for writing televised drama as he was for criticizing the medium's limitations. His most vocal complaints concerned censorship, which was frequently practiced by sponsors and networks. I was not permitted to have my senators discuss any current or pressing problem. He said of his 1957 Studio One production, The Arena intended to be an involving look into contemporary politics. To talk of tariff was to align oneself with the Republicans, to talk of labor was to suggest control by the Democrats. To say a single thing germane to the current political scene was absolutely prohibited. The time element 1958 CBS purchased a teleplay in 1958 that writer Rod Serling hoped to produce as the pilot of a weekly anthology series, The Time Element, marked Serling's first entry in the field of science fiction. Plot 
Several years after the end of World War II, a man named Peter Jensen William Bendix visits a psychoanalyst, Dr. Gillespie, Martin Balsam. Jensen tells him about a recurring dream in which he tries to warn people about the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor before it happens, but the warnings are disregarded. Jensen believes the events of the dream are real, and each night he travels back to 1941. Dr. Gillespie insists that time travel is impossible given the nature of temporal paradoxes. While on the couch, Jensen falls asleep once again but this time dreams that the Japanese planes shoot and kill him. In Dr. Gillespie's office, the couch Jensen was lying on is now empty. Dr. Gillespie goes to a bar where he finds Jensen's picture on the wall. The bartender tells him that Jensen had tended bar there, but he was killed during the Pearl Harbor attack. Topic: <laughs> Production. With the time element script, Serling drafted the fundamental elements that would distinguish the series still to come a science fiction, fantasy theme, opening and closing narration, and an ending with a twist. The time element was purchased immediately, but shelved indefinitely. This is where things stood when Bert Granet, the new producer for Westinghouse Desilu Playhouse, discovered the time element in CBS vaults while searching for an original Serling script to add prestige to his show. The time element, introduced by Desi Arnaz, debuted on November 24, 1958, to an overwhelmingly delighted audience of television viewers and critics alike. The humor and sincerity of Mr. Serling's dialogue made the time element consistently entertaining, offered Jack Gould of The New York Times. Over 6,000 letters of praise flooded Granet's offices. Convinced that a series based on such stories could succeed, CBS again began talks with Serling about the possibilities of producing The Twilight Zone. Where is everybody? was accepted as the pilot episode and the project was officially announced to the public in early 1959. Other than reruns at the time, the time element was not aired on television again until it was shown as part of a 1996 all night sneak preview of the new cable channel TV Land. It is available in an Italian DVD boxed set titled I Confini della Realtà I Tesori per Duty. The Twilight Zone Season 1 Blu-ray boxed set released on September 14, 2010, offers a remastered high-definition version of the original Desilu Playhouse production as a special feature. Topic: Original series 1959 to 1964. The series was produced by Cayuga Productions Inc., a production company owned and named by Serling. It reflects his background in central New York State and is named after Cayuga Lake, on which Ithaca College is located. Aside from Serling, who wrote or adapted nearly two-thirds of the series' total episodes, writers for The Twilight Zone included leading authors such as Charles Beaumont, Ray Bradbury, Earl Hamner Jr., George Clayton Johnson, Richard Matheson, Reginald Rose, and Jerry Sol. Many episodes also featured new adaptations of classic stories by such writers as Ambrose Bierce, Jerome Bixby, Damon Knight, John Collier, and Lewis Paget. 
Twilight Zone's writers frequently used science fiction as a vehicle for social comment, as networks and sponsors who censored controversial material from live dramas were less concerned with seemingly innocuous fantasy and sci-fi stories. Frequent themes on the Twilight Zone included nuclear war, McCarthyism, and mass hysteria, subjects that were avoided on less serious primetime television. Episodes such as, "...The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street", and, "...I Am the Night", "...Color Me Black", offered specific commentary on current events and social issues. Other stories, such as, The Masks, I Dream of Genie, or Mr. Denton on Doomsday, were allegories, parables, or fables that reflected the moral and philosophical choices of the characters. Despite his esteem in the writing community, Serling found the series difficult to sell. Few critics felt that science fiction could transcend empty escapism and enter the realm of adult drama. In a September 22, 1959, interview with Serling, Mike Wallace asked a question illustrative of the times. Why or going to be, obviously, working so hard on the Twilight Zone that, in essence, for the time being and for the foreseeable future, you've given up on writing anything important for television, right? While Serling's appearances on the show became one of its most distinctive features, with his clip delivery still widely imitated today, he was reportedly nervous about it and had to be persuaded to appear on camera. Serling often steps into the middle of the action while the characters remain oblivious to him, but on one notable occasion, they are aware of his presence. In the episode, A World of His Own, a writer Wynn, with the power to alter his reality objects to Serling's narration, and promptly erases Serling from the show. In season two, due to budgetary constraints, the network decided, against Serling's wishes, to cut costs by shooting some episodes on videotape rather than film. The requisite multi-camera setup of the videotape format precluded location shooting, severely limiting the potential scope of the storylines, and the experiment was abandoned after just six episodes. 22. Static. The whole truth. The lateness of the hour. The night of the meek. And. Long distance call. The original series contains 156 episodes. The episodes in seasons 1 through 3 are 30 minutes long. Season 4 consists of one-hour episodes. Season 5 returned to the half-hour format. First Revival 1985 It was Serling's decision to sell his share of the series back to the network that eventually allowed for a Twilight Zone revival. As an in-house production, CBS stood to earn more money producing The Twilight Zone than it could by purchasing a new series produced by an outside company. Even so, the network was slow to consider a revival, turning down offers from the original production team of Rod Serling and Buck Horton and later from American filmmaker Francis Ford Coppola. CBS gave the new Twilight Zone a green light in 1984 under the supervision of Carla Singer, then vice president of drama development. While the show did not come close to matching the enduring popularity of the original, some episodes, particularly Alan Brennett's love story, Her Pilgrim Soul, and J. Neil Shulman's 
profile in silver were critically acclaimed. In a tribute to the original series, the opening credits include a brief image of Rod Serling. Four episodes are remakes of those from the original series Night of the Meek, Shadow Play, The After Hours, and A Game of Pool, while Dead Woman's Shoes is an adaptation of Dead Man's Shoes. Unlike the original series and the second revival, this series does not include the opening monologue during the title sequence. As well, the narration is all strictly voiceover and the narrator never appears on screen. Topic: <laughs> Rod Serling's Lost Classics 1994. In the early 1990s, Richard Matheson and Carol Serling produced an outline for a two-hour made-for-TV movie which would feature Matheson adaptations of three yet unfilmed Rod Serling short stories. Outlines for such a production were rejected by CBS until early 1994, when Serling's widow discovered a complete shooting script, Where the Dead Are authored by her late husband, while rummaging through their garage. She showed the forgotten script to producers Michael O'Hara and Lawrence Horowitz, who were significantly impressed by it. I had a pile of scripts, which I usually procrastinate about reading. But I read this one right away and, after thirty pages, called my partner and said, I love it. Recalled O'Hara. This is pure imagination, a period piece, literate, some might say wordy. If Rod Serling's name weren't on it, it wouldn't have a chance at getting made. Eager to capitalize on Serling's celebrity status as a writer, CBS packaged, Where the Dead Are, with Matheson's adaptation of The Theatre. Debuting as a two-hour feature on the night of May 19, 1994, under the name Twilight Zone, Rod Serling's Lost Classics. The title represents a misnomer, as both stories were conceived long after Twilight Zone's cancellation. Written just months before Serling's death, Where the Dead Are starred Patrick Bergen as a 19th-century doctor who stumbles upon a mad scientist's medical experiments with immortality. The Theatre starred Amy Irving and Gary Cole as a couple who visits a cineplex where they discover the feature presentation depicts their own lives. James Earl Jones provided opening and closing narrations. Critical response was mixed. Gannett News Service described it as, "...taut and stylish, a reminder of what can happen when fine actors are given great words." USA Today was less impressed, even suggesting that Carol Serling, "...should have left these two unproduced mediocrities in the garage where she found them." Ultimately, ratings proved insufficient to justify a proposed sequel featuring three scripts adapted by Matheson. Topic: <laughs> Second Revival 2002-2003 A second revival was developed by UPN in 2002, it was hosted by Forrest Whitaker. It was broadcast in a one-hour format composed of two half-hour stories, it was cancelled after one season. "'It's Still a Good Life' is a sequel to "'It's a Good Life'. The Monsters Are on Maple Street' is an adaptation of the Monsters Are Due on Maple Street, and Eye of the Beholder, 
is a remake of an episode from the original series, with Serling still credited as writer. Topic: Third Revival, 2019 present. In December 2012, it was reported that Brian Singer was developing and executive producing a third revival television series for CBS Television Studios. A writer for the series was not chosen and the program was not pitched to any networks. CBS, which broadcast the original series and first revival, was reportedly interested. In February 2013, Singer told TG Daily that the project was still in development and that he hoped to direct the pilot and have a list actors appear on the revival. The following month, he told IGN that a writer with whom he had previously worked was in negotiations to join the revival and that he felt passionate. Towards the original series and the planned revival, in February 2016, it was reported that Ken Levine would write and direct the pilot episode of the revival series. It was also reported that the series would be interactive. In November 2017, it was reported that Jordan Peele was developing a reboot of the series for streaming service CBS All Access with Marco Ramirez serving as potential showrunner. In December 2017, CBS All Access ordered the third The Twilight Zone revival to series. It was announced that the series would be produced by CBS Television Studios in association with Monkeypaw Productions and Genre Films. Jordan Peele, Marco Ramirez, and Simon Kinberg will serve as executive producers for the series and collaborate on the premiere episode. Wynn Rosenfeld and Audrey Chon will also serve as executive producers. Peel was revealed to be the new host and narrator in September 2018, and the new opening sequence was released. The series premiered on April 1, 2019, the second episode of the series, "'Nightmare at 30,000 Feet' is based on "'Nightmare at 20,000 Feet' Other media Film Twilight Zone, the movie is a 1983 feature film produced by Steven Spielberg. It starred Dan Aykroyd, Albert Brooks, John Lithgow, and the late Vic Morrow and Scatman Crothers. The film remade three classic episodes of the original series and included one original story. John Landis directed the prologue and the first segment, Steven Spielberg directed the second, Joe Dante the third, and George Miller directed the final segment. Landis's episode became notorious for a helicopter accident during filming that caused the deaths of Morrow and two child actors. <laughs> Potential film Actor Leonardo DiCaprio is planning to make a new film with Warner Brothers, citing The Twilight Zone as his favorite TV series. Unlike the first film, which was an anthology feature, it will be a big-budget, SFX-laden continuous story possibly based on classic episodes of the series such as, "'Eye of the Beholder' To Serve Man or any of the 92 scripts written by Rod Serling, to which Warner Brothers owns the rights. One plot leaked from the script tells about a pilot who time travels 96 years into the future. 
Cloverfield director Matt Reeves was signed in 2011 to direct the movie, but left in 2012 to direct Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. On August 16, 2013, Joseph Kaczynski was announced to direct. The studio hired Aaron Eli Colite to pen the screenplay for the film and will not be an anthology but use various elements from the Twilight Zone universe. In June 2017, Christine Lavaff was hired to pen the script. Topic: <laughs> Games. In 1964, Ideal released a board game, The Twilight Zone Game, at the height of the show's popularity. The game consisted of a cardboard playing surface, four colored playing pieces, a colored spinning wheel, and twelve door playing cards. In 1988, Gigabit Systems, Inc. published a text adventure video game for Amiga and the PC. In March 1992, Midway Games released a wide-body pinball game, Twilight Zone, based on the original TV series, as a Bally title. Conceived by Pat Lawler, it uses Golden Earring's hit song, Twilight Zone, 1982, as its theme song. The game sold 15,235 units. On September 17, 2014, Legacy Interactive and Spark Plug Games released a casual adventure game based on the Twilight Zone. <laughs> <laughs> Literature Serling novelized several of his original scripts, which were published in the anthologies Stories from the Twilight Zone 1960, More Stories from the Twilight Zone 1961, and New Stories from the Twilight Zone 1962. These have all been reprinted several times, including in an omnibus, The Twilight Zone, Complete Stories 1980. In 1995, Daw Books published the anthology books Journeys to the Twilight Zone 16 stories edited by Carol Serling including Rod Serling's Suggestion, Return to the Twilight Zone 18 stories edited by Carol Serling including Rod Serling's The Sole Survivor and Adventures in the Twilight Zone 24 stories edited by Carol Serling including Rod Serling's Lindemann's Catch In September 2009 Tor Books published Twilight Zone 19 original stories on the 50th anniversary to mark the 50th anniversary of the series it contains stories by 20 authors such as R. L. Stein and Timothy Zahn, and an introduction by Carol Serling. Topic comic books Western Publishing published a Twilight Zone comic book, first providing content under contract to publisher Dell Comics for four issues, one in 1961 and three further issues in 1962, with the first two published as part of their long-running four-color anthology series as issue numbers 1173 and 1288, and then two further one-shots numbers numbered separately in Dell's unique fashion as 01-860-207 and 12-860-210 numbered as 01-860-210 on the inside respectively. Western then restarted the series under its own gold key imprint with a formal issue number one, which ran 92 issues from 1962 to 1979, with the final issue being published in 1982. Several of the stories were reprinted in their Mystery Comics Digest, which mentioned the title on the covers. 
A wide range of artists worked on the title, including Jack Sparling, Reed Crandall, Lee Elias, George Evans, Russ Jones, Joe Orlando, Jerry Robinson, Mike Sikowski, Dan Spiegler, Frank Thorne, and Alex Toth. The first published comic book work of artist Frank Miller appeared in issue 84 June 1978. In 1990, Now Comics published a new comic series with using the title logo from the 1985 revival. The publisher made great efforts to sign established sci-fi, fantasy writers, including Harlan Ellison, adapting his story Crazy as a Soup Sandwich. In 2008, students at the Savannah College of Art and Design partnered with Walker & Co. to create graphic novels based on eight episodes of the series through 2009. The first four, Walking Distance, The After Hours, The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street, and The Odyssey of Flight 33, were released in December 2011. The other four were The Midnight Sun, Death's Head Revisited, The Big Tall Wish and Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up? Comics publisher Dynamite Entertainment ran a multiple issue series, written by J. Michael Straczynski and with art by Guy Villanova, beginning in December 2013. <laughs> Topic: Television series. Marius Constant composed the theme used for the majority of the series. This replaced Bernard Herrmann's theme for the first season, though Constant's theme is more associated with the recognizable sound of the Twilight Zone and most of its incarnations. Other music contributors for the original television show are Jerry Goldsmith, Leonard Rosenman, Nathan Scott, Fred Steiner, Nathan Van Cleve, and Franz Waxman. CBS Television CBS Session Musicians Howard Roberts Avant-garde composer Marius Constant wrote the well-known theme introduced in the second season. The Grateful Dead performed the theme for the 1985 revival series. Jonathan Davis of Korn composed the theme music for the 2002 revival series. Marco Beltrami and Brandon Roberts composed the music for the 2019 revival. Topic: Film Jerry Goldsmith composed the music for Twilight Zone, the movie 1983. Topic influence in popular music The market's biggest hit, Out of Limits, originally entitled Outer Limits, was named after the 1963 TV series The Outer Limits. Rod Serling sued the markets for quoting the four-note motif from The Twilight Zone, without his approval, which resulted in the change of the title to Out of Limits. It reached number three on the Billboard Hot 100 chart in 1964. It sold over one million copies, and was awarded a gold disc. Many other musicians have written and performed music based on The Twilight Zone, including Two Unlimited, Twilight Zone, Anthrax, Intro to Reality, Average White Band, John Cale, Dr. John, David Dubofsky, To Serve Man, Golden Earring, Twilight Zone, Michael Hurley, Tech Nine, Iron Maiden, Twilight. Zone, Mekong Delta, Twilight Zone, Van Morrison, Twilight Zone, Rush, The Twilight Zone, Raymond Scott, Sly and Robbie, Magneto Deo, The Manhattan Transfer, Twilight Zone, Twilight Tone, The Residents, The Ventures, Twilight Zone, Panic at the Disco, and John Williams. Topic. 
Topic: Radio. Beginning in 2002, episodes of the original The Twilight Zone were adapted for radio, with Stacy Keach taking Serling's role as narrator and produced by Carl Amari of Falcon Picture Group. Each episode features a current Hollywood celebrity, including Jason Alexander, Blair Underwood, Lou Gossett Jr., Michael York, Jim Caviezel, Jane Seymour, Don Johnson, Sean Astin, Luke Perry and others in the title roles. The series is broadcast on hundreds of radio stations from coast to coast and over Sirius, XM. The station list and episodes for download, including three free episodes are available at the official website at www.twilightsandairradio.com. Scripts <laughs> 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 Beginning in 2001, Gauntlet Press began publishing collections of original scripts from The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont, Richard Matheson, and Rod Serling. A ten-volume signed, limited edition series of all 92 of Rod Serling's scripts, authorized by his wife, Carol Serling, began yearly publication in 2004. Many of the scripts contain handwritten edits by Serling himself and differ in significant ways from the aired versions. Most volumes contain an alternate version of a selected script. The script for The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street has been published into seventh grade reading books in the form of a play. Topic: Stage productions. Live theater productions of the original episodes can be seen in Los Angeles and Seattle, where Theater Schmierter has continuously produced a late-night series, The Twilight Zone Live, with permission of the Serling Estate, since 1996. In 2009 Masquerade, a Chennai-based theatre group produced Dystopia, loosely based on the episodes, The Obsolete Man, and Five Characters in Search of an Exit. In 2011, the Penn State University theatre group, No Refund Theatre, produced a stage adaptation of The Twilight Zone. It included the episodes, The Eye of the Beholder, The Midnight Sun, and Nothing in the Dark. It was directed by Anthony Arbeza. In 2017, Bethesda Chevy Chase High School produced a live adaptation directed by Adam Graham with permission from CBS, with two shows containing four episodes each. These episodes included, Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up? and The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street, as well as more technically challenging episodes such as, Penny for Your Thoughts and The Eye of the Beholder. In December 2017 the Almeida Theatre in London are staging the world premiere production of The Twilight Zone. Adapted by Anne Washburn and directed by Laurence Olivier Award winner Richard Jones, and will be based on stories from the original series by Rod Serling, Charles Beaumont and Richard Matheson. Topic: Theme Park Attraction The Twilight Zone Tower of Terror is a theme park attraction based on the original Twilight Zone series. Designed by Walt Disney Imagineering, the attraction is present at Disney's Hollywood Studios in Orlando, Walt Disney Studios Park in Paris and Tokyo Disney Sea in Japan. 
A fourth attraction at Disney California Adventure operated from 2004 to 2017 before being rethemed to Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. The attraction in Japan is the only one not themed to the Twilight Zone, due to cultural differences and constraints in licensing for the Oriental Land Company, owner and operator of the Tokyo Parks. The ride also served as the inspiration for the 1997 TV film Tower of Terror, which bears no connection to the attraction or the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Syndication The Twilight Zone original series is currently in syndication on METV Network and Sci-Fi, and the 2002 revival is syndicated on the El Rey Network. In popular culture During the 1980s the British food company, Jacobs, ran a TV advertisement for one of its products, a type of biscuit called Twiglets. The advertisement was titled, The Twiglet Zone. It showed a number of strange situations that occurred whenever somebody ate a Twiglet. One particular example was that of a subway train that vanished because somebody had opened a bag of twiglets between stations. See also Science fiction on television <laughs>